what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object is a classic paradox that's been used as a thought experiment by philosophers since ancient times and has been used as a metaphor for almost that long by sports writers looking to add figurative weight to an upcoming matchup. In the UFC Apex this Saturday night, we will witness a main event that is not a case of unstoppable force versus a movable object, but rather a collision between two different kinds of unstoppable force, as the UFC heavyweight division's all-time leader in takedowns faces the division's all-time leader in knockouts. That alone would qualify the matchup as big, but when you add in the fact that Curtis Blades and Derek Lewis push the upper limit of the UFC's biggest division, and their clash carries immediate title implications, it becomes a feeling of something epic. Welcome to the Sherdog sure Radio Network preview for UFC on ESPN 18, or if you prefer, UFC Vegas 15. I'm your host, Ben Duffy. With me to break down the high-stakes headliner between Blades and Lewis, as well as the 10 fights preceding it, is Keith Schillen. Keith is executive producer of the MMA Network, as well as a writer for SureDog.com and a host and creator of numerous shows for SureDog Radio, including the Schillen and Duffy Show. Keith, I'll jump right into it with a, a question for you about this card. The UFC cards on flagship ESPN they've typically treated as a chance to advertise themselves to the public at large. It's usually headlined by either a, an action fight, a heavyweight fight, or if they can get it, a combination of both. And it looks like a chance for them to present their own product to the public, as well as expose individual fighters that they think have a chance of getting over. Looking at this card outside of the main event, which of the other 10 fights, or even just which of the other 20 individual fighters is the one who's probably going to benefit the most from some free advertising? Well, that's a great question. So I really like the Spike Carlisle, Bill Algeo fight. I think both those guys are pretty talented. Uh, Spike Carlisle has a huge personality. He has a wild man fight style. He's kind of like the ginger version of Diego Sanchez. So oh, yeah. you kind of, you kind of like that. Algeo, very cocky fighter, but in a in a fun way. I mean, he, his USC debut against Ricardo Lamas, he's taunting a former title challenger. So they both have the charisma. They both have style. Miguel Baeza is another guy that he's undefeated, uh, coming off a big win over Matt Brown. I mean, if he can get another big win on this card, that's somebody that you know you start getting excited about. So there's there's definitely some prospects. Like this is not a throwaway card. Now, there's some throwaway fights. There's a lot of Matchups that I'm just like, oh, it is what it is. Hopefully, we, hopefully we get something fun out of it. But there, there is some talent, and honestly, the women fights don't really jump out at you. Being, you know, probably low level UFC f f women, but the divisions are always so shallow that one or two wins in that division, and and you're ranked. So they actually matter too. There you go. And with that, let's jump right into the prelims. The first fight out of the gate at UFC on ESPN 18 is a bantamweight matchup between Nathan Maness and Luke Sanders. Uh, Maness, 12-1 and overall, is 1-0 uh, and in the UFC, having made a successful debut against uh, Johnny Munoz just back in August. Sanders is 13-3. and He is... Three and three in the UFC and has been out for uh, over a year and a half. Uh, last fought Hanan Burrell. So that feels like it must have been five years ago, but it was uh, just barely one and a half years ago. But nonetheless, uh, three and oh in the UFC with wins over Maximo Blanco, Patrick Williams, and Burrell. Losses to Uriel Contra, Andre Sukumtat, and Hani Yaya. Uh, Sanders is the slight favorite, sitting around minus 140 right now. Uh, you can get Manus on the comeback around plus 120. Uh, how do you feel about this fight, and how does it turn out, Keith? Well, it's hard to get excited about Luke Sanders because he's been so inactive, as you mentioned. I think at this point he's most famous for once dating that WWF wrestler girl. Um, I I apologize. I wasn't planning on talking about her, so I forgot her name, but I'm sure there's wrestling fans out there know who I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not a wrestling person. Uh, but, you know, Sanders at one time was kind of 
had some buzz about him when he first came in the UFC, but that was a, such a long time ago. He's coming off some pretty bad losses. He's 34 years old. Uh, he's been on the shelf for 21 months. It, that's kind of been the theme of his career recently. Technically, he's a southpaw, good pocket boxer. His straight left is pretty good. He does throw hard, has decent power. He likes to come forward. He doesn't really like to be backed up. He doesn't like to be forced off his back foot. He lacks head movement, which is why he was rocked by Henan Barrow. He was rocked by Andre Sikwatoth, by Ronnie Yaya. I mean, Barrow also battered him to the body with kicks. He's a decent grappler, uh, though he doesn't really use it enough. Move over to Nick Manez. He's 29, so you like that. He's a little bit younger. 21... Uh, sorry, 12 and 1, though I do think he should have lost his last fight. I thought Johnny Munoz beat him. I thought like, he clearly beat him despite the point re- uh, to deduction in that fight. Uh, that said, I had to re watch the fight because I completely forgot about the fight and I completely forgot about Nick Maness as, as a fighter because there's nothing really that exciting about him. Kind of flat footed. He's, he's um, also a southpaw, though he does switch stances a little bit. He loves the leaping right hook, which he kind of overthrows. Telegraphs his strikes a lot by loading up on them so much. He'll go for a takedown, uh, though he's you know not a strong wrestler. He's he's a mediocre, I would say, wrestler. He can be out muscled, like Johnny Munoz was out muscling him against the cage. He's a pretty weak defensive wrestler. He struggled off the bottom against Johnny Munoz. Was at one point mounted by Johnny Munoz. Johnny Munoz. During the mount was teeing off him in the first round. Like Menez was actually saved by the bell in that fight. So as far as prediction, to me, this really comes down to what does Luke Sanders have, have left? Does he have anything left? And if he does, I still think he can beat low level UFC fighter. And that's what I think Menez is, if he even is a UFC fighter. Uh Menez is pretty bad on the ground. He's nothing special on the feet. So I think Sanders should have a little bit left. Hopefully he does. So I'm going to take Sanders. I'm going to take him by second round TKO. Fantastic. Uh, technically, I don't really have much to add there, but I'm just dying anytime you ask me to choose between someone who's been on the shelf for almost two years and somebody who really won just a robbery in his debut and was getting worked over on the ground in the first round. I mean... Menes is someone who can uh, absolutely. I, I'm sorry, Sanders is someone who can absolutely do that uh, to Menes. And uh, unlike like Yuri Alcantara or Hani Yaya, I don't see Menes like you know pulling a, a hail mary leg lock uh, out of it. So yeah, give me Sanders as well. Uh, hard to have faith in someone who's been on the shelf that long, but I think he's got enough for Sanders. Give me Menes by decision. Just to jump in real quick. I just looked up who Luke Sanders' ex-girlfriend was. Becky Lynch, that's her name. And oh. if I recall, she's she's like one of the stars of the WWE. Yeah, I think she's the I one that so. like was fe- feuding with Ronda Rousey. So yeah. Yeah, like I think she's a mega star. Like I don't know how like Luke Sanders got him, but uh, like, good, good good for him. Maybe I, 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 I think maybe she wasn't a star when they were dating. I, I don't really know. And uh, clearly has some skills that he's not shown in the octagon yet, and uh, we hope we never see those ones in the octagon. But uh, th- this one, we are both uh, picking him to get it done. We now head down to the men's fly where in our next fight, Sue Mudarji will take on Malcolm Gordon. Uh, Mudarji is 12-4 and four overall, 1-1 one and one in the UFC. Uh, he fought most recently in August, where he got back on track by defeating Andre Sukumtat. Gordon, the 30-year-old Canadian, is 0-1 in the UFC. He lost his debut to uh, Amir Albazi on July 18th on the Figueredo versus Benavidez 2 card. Uh, Mudarji is a big favorite here, uh, one of the bigger favorites on the card. He, he's sitting around minus uh, 330 to minus 350. Gordon, you can get him around plus 275. Uh, who takes this uh, flyweight battle. Well, first thing I want to jump on, which was kind of the theme, what we said last week, is I think the line's off. Now, I'm not saying that Gordon wins, but I think the line should be closer. Majority, majority 
and he's been off for a year. The Chinese fighter, twenty four, so you like that. He's at the age where you should expect improvements. Southpaw kind of has a karate style. He's very light on his feet. Nice moves, movement, busy jab, nice straight left, kicks everywhere, similar to most of the Taekwondo t- traditional karate style guys. He likes the hook kick, which is kind of fun to see. He does lack power. Like he's he's not a like one punch hit a hit or quitter kind of guy. Not much of a wrestler, though. If he does get on top, he has shown some pretty good top control and some good ground and pound. He just will struggle to get it there. Malcolm Gordon, as I just mentioned, this is, I said, kind of a theme. This might be the theme this week. Seems like a regional guy to me. He's pretty explosive, pretty fast hands. His chin is very questionable. He's marked in the past. He's, I mean, he's just starting his UFC career, and he already has three KO losses on his record. Not a not a wrestler, but a grappler, if that makes sense. Like he will struggle to get the ground there, but if he does, he can get a submission. He has six submission wins. He is a weak defensive wrestler, but when I just watch it, watch him overall, nothing really jumps out to me. So at this point, I feel like Gordon is who he is, and Majari is at the age, as I mentioned, where he can make big improvements. So I expect to see a better fighter this time in the cage that we saw against Andre Sikmatov, and he dominated Andre Sikmatov. So give me Majari. I'm going to say by unanimous decision. Great. And something that I apologize, I should have mentioned right off the jump, and you were already aware of it, which is why you just jumped straight in. But it's especially odd that Mudarji is this big a favorite, considering that this is his debut at flyweight. He's jump, He's dropping down from Bantamweight for the first time. My only real concerns are over that. Just based on skill and on what they've shown, uh, I think he has enough to beat Gordon anywhere. My, my problem is he was already a skinny, spindly, praying mantis of a guy at Bantamweight. Like, there are a lot of 5'8 Bantamweights, but he looked like a, a skinny dude. I don't know what he's going to look like at flyweights, but there's, there's you know every possibility that Gordon turns out to be the stronger guy in the clinch or the guy who, for once in his career, can kind of dictate the wrestling. And if that happens, all bets are off. But... Based on what I've seen from them so far, I'm going to just cast my lot in with Mudarji to uh, to look fine at flyweight and pull off a decision as well. Yeah, well, I'm just going to jump in there one more time. You just mentioned he's moving down weight class. I didn't even realize that. So when I when I was thinking the line was too big at negative 320, I was thinking uh, it probably should be negative 220. Mm-hmm. Now that you mentioned he's moving down a weight class, which is you know the lower you get down, the harder it is. You know, you have less body fat to suck off, and I think he probably should be 185, 175. Like, I don't think it should be that big of a line at all anymore. Yeah, it's uh, you have to think it's probably just a referendum on Gordon and how kind of mediocre he looked in his debut. That That's the only thing it can really be, because Mudarji hasn't been a world beater either. He's just been a prospect with some potential, who now is moving down in weight off a win. I We don't know why, but we'll see how it turns out. The UFC on ESPN 18 prelims power on, and we move up to the featherweight division where Kai Kamaka III will take on Jonathan Pierce. Uh, Kamaka, 25 years old, 8-2 overall, 1-0 in his UFC career, having successfully debuted against Tony Kelly at UFC 252 back in August. Pierce is 28 years old. The man who calls himself JSP... He is 9-4 and four overall. He is 0-1 in the UFC. Uh, joined the UFC off the Contender Series way back last summer. Debuted against uh, Joe Lozon at uh, UFC on ESPN6 uh, last October. And just seemed to catch Joe Lozon in the middle of one of his latest and most recent vintage Joe Lozon performances. Got dusted in about 90 seconds. Uh, Kamaka is a significant... Uh, favorite on this card, sitting around minus 330 right now. Pierce around plus 270. Uh, I'll go first on on this one. I do like Kamaka quite a bit in, in this one. I, I liked him uh, in his little spat in, in Bellator. I liked him in LFA. And I thought he looked good against uh, Kelly back in August. He is... He's... 
not the not the typical Hawaiian brawler cliche stereotype that we've come to you know that we've come to know and love and hopefully grow past over over the last five or ten years in in the sport. Uh, but you know he, he's a good all around fighter, a uh, good wrestler, physically strong, powerful, athletic uh, featherweight. He's not one of the biggest featherweights in the world, but I haven't seen him in any fight where. A, a disadvantage in size and strength cost him. I think uh, against Pierce, he's going to have the ability to make the fight uh, work where it wants. I, I suspect we'll, we'll see a fight where he'll exchange on the feet, uh, brawl for as long as he, he wants to, and if things aren't going his way or he just feels it, he, he'll nail a takedown and go to work on the ground. And I think that's actually a game plan he can make work here because... Uh, Pierce isn't the kind of guy that is just going to put him out with one punch. He, he's he's not that kind of striker. So Kamaka has a little bit of uh, he has a little bit of freedom to uh, experiment with it on the feet if he wants, and and I think he'll have the the ability to take it to the ground whenever he wants. Give me Kamaka by uh, unanimous decision. Yeah, Kamaka's a guy. So both these guys I know a lot about because they both come from the Contender Series. Kamaka's he's a well-rounded guy. He stands with a very high, tight guard, um, varies his attacks. He has a large arsenal of attacks, large, uh, just large amount of weapons he goes to. Some real snap on his punches, ha- throws some hard hooks. I mean, he was battering Tony Kelly with his left hook. I love that he attacks the body, which is always a good thing to see from a young fighter. Throws teep kicks down the middle. He loves to step in knees. Shout out to my boy, Dave Chick Palm Stewart. Uh, he does get hit in the pocket a lot because he just slides right in. So he kind of, he kind of gets hit because he just slides in. He's not scared of his opponent's power in the ch- in the in the clinch. Oh well, he actually let me back up. He has a solid chin. Like although he gets hit a lot, like Tony Kelly was hit with everything, and Kamaka kept coming. Uh, solid chin, uh, solid clinch game. He does has an NCW wrestling background. Got some nice takedowns. Though he has been taken down in the past, he gassed a little against Tony Kelly, but fought through it. And he's taken this fight on short notice, so that's something to, to remember. Uh, this was supposed to be Sean Woodson's fight against Jonathan Pierce. Uh, Pierce, MMA lab guy, he's a another thing I keep saying. He's a good regional fighter. Like that's what he seems like to me. Uh, he really feasted on low level competition to get invited in the Contender Series, eventually the UFC debut. He's pretty athletic. He's an okay striker, decent jab, pretty accurate right hand. Can be a little reckless because he lacks head movement. He does like some high-flying stuff, like a flying knee. He throws kicks everywhere. That's the majority of his striking game. Yeah, taller guy, so he's pretty good in the clinch. Grabs the plum clinch, knees up the middle. Okay wrestler, but it's kind of like the thing I keep saying, like, okay, okay, nothing really jumps out at you. Not much of an entries, like he does not not much of a drop step. He gets most of his takedowns from body locks. He'll try a lateral drop, which the higher level you go up, the less that's going to work. It's pretty risky, especially against a guy like Kamaka who comes from a wrestling background. And he will burn energy trying to like excite the crowd with stuff that's not as effective, like suplexes. If he does get on top, he passes the guard, so I like that. He does have some pretty good ground and pound. And, but if he gets taken down, he'll give up his back to get up, which is never a good thing. I don't think Kamaka should be a negative 330 favorite simply because he's taking the fight on short notice. Like, he's taking the fight on, like, less than a week's notice, I think, or, so, or something like that. Like, Sean Woodson just dropped out. So that definitely worries me, and it's something to keep in mind. That Other than that, though, he's better than Pierce everywhere he's a better striker he has so many more weapons when you talked about who sh- jumps out at you on the card and i was mentioning some prospects i shouldn't mention kamaka i just i just kind of forgot it uh he's he's one of the best prospects on this card i like him in his future going forward and then flipped it over to paris i don't like him at all i mean he gets smashed by joe lazan in 2019 in under two minutes i give him a little bit of pass because it was in boston it was a joe lazan's hometown there was a Big rumor that was his last fight. Uh, you know, UFC debut against Joel Zahn. But still, 2019 loss of Joel Zahn still p- pretty bad. So give me Kamaka. I think he ends it in the first round. TKO. 
the bold call there from Keith Schillen on Kamaka versus Pierce. Next up, we are in the women's flyweight division as Gina Mazzani takes on Rachel Ostovich. Uh, Mazzani, six and four overall, the 32 year old Alaskan is uh, 0 and 1 in the UFC. She lost via super ultra quick knockout uh, to Julia Vila back in June. Ostovich is four and five in her entire career, one and two in her UFC career. Uh, three and four, if you expand that to include her fights in Invicta. She is a plus 130 underdog, where Mazzani is coming in at minus 150 or so right now. This will be the second fight on the card where a fighter dropping down to a new weight class is a favorite in their debut in that division. Uh, I'll go first on this one. I mean, first off, this is not a super high-level fight. So it's just a question of which fighter has more glaring question marks versus which one has actually shown us more. I I don't feel good saying this because, you know, she, she has a story to her and, and has kind of some difficulty and, and tragedy that, you know, we, we've all had to kind of witness and, you know, and, and report on, but Rachel Ostovich at this point has shown no indications that she's a UFC level fighter. She's one and two in the UFC. Her losses are to Montana De La Rosa and Paige Van Zandt, you know, neither of whom is, is a terrible fighter, but neither of whom is a world beater or even on the cusp of the top 10. And her one win was over Kareen uh, Kevorkian, who was on tough with her and was one of the worst fighters from that season of tough. So essentially she's beaten nobody who's UFC level. Uh, the problem with Ostovich is in the very early stages of her, of her career, uh, her her game plan worked. I mean, she she wants the takedown, uh, and once she gets it there, you know, would prefer the submission. She wants to take you down, beat you up some, and you know, and and choke you out or 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 just beat on you. That hasn't worked against UFC level flyweights. She just doesn't have the physicality for it. Uh, her versus Montana De La Rosa. Her versus Paige Van Zant. It's not even rock paper scissors. It's just rock rock rock. And they were bigger rocks than she was because they are also were two fighters that thrive when they can be the bully and they're the better wrestler and suffer when they aren't. But against Ostovich, they just, you know, she didn't have anything for them. I think Mazzani's going to be that again. Uh, I like the idea of Mazzani dropping to flyweight because Mazzani wanted to be that at Bantamweight and it just didn't work. She didn't, she didn't have the physicality to impose that kind of game on UFC level Bantamweights. Uh, if if she can drop to flyweight and remain essentially the same fighter she is physically, I think she's going to do to Ostovich, uh, you know, basically what Paige Van Zant did, maybe minus the finish. Uh, give me Mazzani. Uh, give me Mazzani by a third round finish, either uh, a TKO on the ground or a submission on the ground, but a dominant performance from uh, from Mazzani. Am I out of my mind, Keith Schillen? <laughs> well, I don't know if you're picking against Rachel Ostevich. is out of your mind, considering she has a losing record. Uh, you said it right. You talked about how terrible Rachel Ostevich is. She's a really low MMA fighter. Is she UFC level? I don't know. But Gina Mazzani's not much better either. She's extremely low, too. We'll start with Ostevich. She's, you mentioned she's off been off the shelf for two years now, almost two years. Not much confidence in her stand-up, though in the Paige Van Zandt fight, she did start showing a right hand. She was starting to hit it. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that she's a stand-up fighter, but she needs she showed some little improvement, so I like that. The one thing I do like about Rachel Osovich is that she uses her, her striking to set up her takedowns, and she was taking Paige Van Zandt down. She's can grind against the fence. That's kind of where she likes to do best. So get a body lock and just kind of grind against the fence, which wins rounds. Pretty decent body lock takedown. She took Paige Van Zandt down a couple times. When she's on top, though, things fall apart a little bit because she'll either lay and pray and not do much or she'll chase the sub and completely lose position. And that's what happened in the Paige Van Zandt fight. And then Paige Van Zandt took her back and submitted her. Moved it over to Gina Mazzani. Gina Mazzani's last two fights, she was, it was against uh, Julia Vela and 
Macy Chazon, which uh, Chason, which is two really good fighters. She got absolutely ran through. Like they, she was no match to them. But like we just said, they're good fighters. Southpaw, she's pretty aggressive on the feet, though she's very raw. Like kind of, I would say in a striking battle, probably pretty equal to Rachel Ostevich. She would look for the takedown. I agree with you. Moving down to bantamweight is definitely the best thing for her because she also likes to grind in the clinch. So it's this is going to be probably be a boring fight with a lot of clinch battling. Mazzani is probably stronger and, as we mentioned, has faced the toughest competition. That says, I think Osevich might be the better wrestler, like technically. She'll be smaller. You you mentioned you think Paige, that Mazzani will do what Paige Van Zandt did to her, which is very similar, but Paige Van Zandt was losing until she got her back and submitted her. So screw it. I want to take Race to Osevich to. Uh, is it would it make her record 500? Yep. Yeah, so you know what? We'll, we'll get out the champagne when <laughs> Ray Slashovic <laughs> is uh is 5 and 5. Twitter and Instagram will go crazy cuz she'll still be in the UFC, which I'm sure she'll probably still be in the UFC no matter what until she gets a boob reduction. Uh but yeah, I'm going to say Rachel Ostevich in my first upset pick of the of the uh evening. How did she get it done, Keith? Oh, um, split decision. Outstanding. The UFC Vegas 15 prelims power on with a bantamweight matchup between Martin Day and Anderson Dos Santos. Uh, This is a fight that in any other year might be a pink slip derby as both men are 0-2 in the UFC, but no such guarantee in a year that the UFC is in need of bodies who are ready, willing, and available uh, on short notice in particular. Day is 8-4 and four overall. As stated before, 0-2 uh, in the UFC, having lost to Ping Wan Lu back in 2018 and then Davy Grant this July. Anderson Dos Santos, whose name makes it sound like he should already have a UFC title, is instead in search of his first UFC win. He lost to Nad Naramani, Back in 2018, lost to Andre Yule last summer and has been off since then. So nearly an 18 month layoff, Uh, despite both men having been fairly inactive in their UFC careers, uh, they they are meeting and day the slight favorite right now, sitting around minus 160, minus 170. Dos Santos available around uh, plus 145. Keith Schilling, who takes this one? So. Yeah, another really low matchup between low-level UFC fighters. I think it's pretty safe to say the loser of this fight will probably... I don't know if they'll be cut from the UFC, but they'll make our recap cut list. I, I'd probably guess that. The one thing I will say about this fight, they're both strikers. So this could be a fun back-and-forth fight. Even though it's low-level, You know, sometimes I like watching you know, CES and see two guys that have no shot at the UFC slug it out. And that's what we might get here. I'll start with Martin Day. Very tall for the weight class. Long, lengthy. I think And the last time he fought, you said he had legs that just ran for days. Like, um, he, He's that, pretty... Go ahead. You, make it, you make it sound creepy when you say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's funny. Yes. You, talk, you talk more about Martin Day's legs than Rachel Ostevich's. Uh, well, so, that, that's each, what you get. Each their own. Um, so he's pretty elusive. He stays... Fairly loose, which I always liked. He has fast hands. He works behind a jab, uh, behind a jab and a teep kick. That's kind of like his two go-to strikes. Has nice timing on his right hand. Pretty good power. He almost knocked out Davy Grant in his last fight in the first round. He likes spinning attacks, especially the back kick. She landed on Davy Grant. Chin might be an issue because I keep bringing up the Davy Grant fight because that's the most recent one. And why I say Chin might be an issue because he was knocked out cold by Davy Grant who really isn't known for his striking. Uh, Day is a weak defensive wrestler, though he does get up pretty well. Like He has a good get-up game. He's good in scrambles, looking for submissions. He looks for guillotines, looks for darts chokes in the scrambles, so that's good. Move over to Anderson Dos Santos. He's a stalking brawler. 
he loads up on everything, making it super easy to read. He is very right hand happy, just kind of throwing the overhand right, trying to get the knockout with one punch. He in his last fight, he went against Andre Uhl and and really struggled with the length of Andre Uhl. He has no defense at all. Like I didn't want to break down his defense because he I don't know if he knows you can or move your head. <laughs> he will look for a takedown. But his setups are ugly. He shoots from too far away. He's just not a wrestler. So how do I think this fight goes? I think it's going to look a lot like the Uwe fight. I don't think it'll be as one-sided as the Uwe fight. But Day is a long, lengthy guy that I think will pick apart Dos Santos from range. So I think I'm going to take Day to win by unanimous decision. Outstanding. Uh, I have Day as well. This is a bad matchup for Dos Santos for a lot of the same reasons that the, that the Ewell fight was. Uh, Dos Santos you know, doesn't have great uh, footwork, even though he does want to, you know, stalk you and, and, and chase you down. And he's going against a guy with well, at least better footwork, longer reach, uh, a, a younger guy with, you know, better hand and foot speed. And there's no guarantee that even against a wrestler like Day, he's going to be able to get it to the ground if he wants. I mean, we are talking about a guy with twice as many submissions as uh, knockouts uh, in in Dos Santos. I think he's just going to have a miserable day, just kind of stuck at the end of Day's range. You know, it should be a fun fight, but I expect Day to win all three rounds in pretty un- uncontroversial fashion. They might win fight of the night, even though there's definitely favoritism towards you know fights later on the card for that kind of honor but it maybe it'll deserve fight of the night uh while day is picking up his first ufc win we stay in the bantamweight division but move over to the women's side as ashley evan smith takes on norma dumont viana uh ashley evan smith 33 years old is six and four in her ufc career she is uh three and four in the ufc she will be taking on the 30-year-old Viana. The Brazilian is 4-1 and one in her UFC career. She lost her UFC debut back in February to Megan Anderson via first-round uh, TKO, promptly dropped to Bantamweight. Uh, she is, however, a Bantamweight making her debut in her new division, who is not a favorite, unlike the other two dropping fighters we've talked to about already tonight. Uh I will go first, and I actually kind of like Viana in this one. Uh, Viana wasn't in the fight with Anderson long enough to show us what she planned to do, but based on how she won fights on the regional scene in Brazil, she wanted to come crashing forward, put her hands on her, and throw her on the mat, which that just wasn't going to work for her against Megan Anderson. You know, there are people who, who can, you know, crash the pocket on Megan Anderson and throw her down. It, it's been done. But they are the Holly Holmes and Felicia Spencers of the world. They are not Norma Dumont. Uh, assuming that she wants to do the same here against Ashley Evan Smith, I think she can. Like, Smith is is one who she's been around for a while. I mean, she actually has been in the UFC longer than just about any other woman on roster. She's been in the UFC since... 2014 but it's not her three and four record it's not even a case of well she's beaten the bad fighters and lost to the good ones because she's lost to some bad ones as well and after six seven fights in the ufc i'm still not sure what ashley evan smith really does well so my extremely scientific pick is that uh viana is going to win a decision here where uh you know, she probably takes the first two rounds and has to hold on for the third. So give me Viana via decision in the very tiny upset. All right. So Norma Dumont is moving down from featherweight to bantamweight. Gina Mazzani was also moving down from featherweight to bantamweight. So that's like 40% of the UFC's featherweight division moving the, down in this but, card. No, Mazzani's going from uh, bantamweight to flyweight. Oh, my. Oh, did, did Mazzani, Mazzani did fight a she fought a f- featherweight at one point, right? Or am, I, am I imagining I th- that wrong? I, no, I think she must have because when I saw she was dropping in weight, I assumed she was dropping from featherweight to bantamweight as well, but okay. she'd already been at bantamweight. Oh, yeah. For some reason, I thought she fought a featherweight, but either way. Anyways, so, okay, so not 40%. We'll say 10% of the division, whatever it is. Moving down. Uh, Ashley Evan-Smith, she's been on the shelf for 21 months. 
I think the only thing I've heard about her is that she was stealing from her neighbor, whatever that was. Uh, she is moving back up to Bantamweight. She's a high output fighter, pressure fighter. Though even though she ha- has a lot of output, she's kind of stiff on the feet. Throws a lot of arm punches. Stay- stands up way too high. No head movement. Loses power because they're all arm punches. Keeps her head on the set of line, leaving her able to be struck. Andrea Lee punished her to the body with uh, kicks. She does throw a lot of kicks herself, especially to the legs. She does have a pretty good teep kick down the middle. She's a good wrestler, though she often shoots from way too far away without any setup. When she, and she also has a very tell sign because when she switches to the southpaw stance, that's when she's looking to wrestle because that's most of what she wrestled back in the day. She led with her, you know, her right leg, so her more dominant, stronger leg. So you can see that if she gets a takedown, uh, solid top control, but she's not Habib Nurmagomedov on the ground. Move on, uh, Noma Dumont. She's 30 years old, so I don't like that for someone who's you know just starting the UFC career. But she should be the bigger fighter. I mean, you got one going up from flyweight, the other one coming down from featherweight. So that yeah, you, know, you like that. She does throw hard. Like in the Megan Anderson fight, she was swinging for the fences. She was trying to get a knockout, though she did keep her chin high in the air, which is why Megan Anderson knocked her out, and chin might be an issue. I'm not going to pretend like I know a lot about Dumont. I tried finding some regional stuff. A lot of it's not that good to find. But I'm backing you. I'm also picking her simply for one reason. I know Ashley Evan Smith is not good. I don't know that Norma Dumont is not good. Like she <laughs> did very well as she could suck. But I'll go with the unknown. So I'm going to take don't, – if, if, don't track us in betting. Uh, at least track Ben if you want, but don't track me on this one. I'm – I don't think it's a good bet to say Ashley Evans Smith isn't good, so let me take the other person. But that's basically what I'm doing. So give me uh, Dumont by split decision. Outstanding. And once again, you heard it here first. Uh, Norman Dumont currently available as high as plus 123. So uh, Keith Schillen is telling you that to go ahead and bet the house on Norma Dumont – as long as you have an extra house that you are not using and won't miss if it's gone. <laughs> if that is the case, strong confidence pick here. Do you think there's anybody listening to the show that, that has two houses? No, I we'll probably to, not. We'll have to check our, uh, our numbers in Malibu and Beverly yeah. Hills. and maybe, Who knows? But we're very popular in the ritzy areas. Well, if, if if we're popular with people who have, like, too much money, that, that's not a bad thing. I'll take a look at the analytics. We now move up to the men's featherweight division for a clash between a couple of interesting slash promising contenders in Spike Carlisle and Bill Algio. Carlisle, the 27-year-old Californian, is 9-2 and two in his UFC career. He is... One and one in the UFC made a sensational debut back in February, uh, knocking out Elon Cruz in about a minute and a half, and then putting forth a very memorable uh, post-fight speech in which uh, you know the, the the endearing nuttiness of his personality was laid bare. Came back in May and lost a competitive decision to Billy Quarantillo. Bill Aljo is thirteen and five. In his MMA career, the 31-year-old is 0-1 in the UFC. He made his debut back in August, uh, taking on veteran and former UFC title challenger Ricardo Lamas, losing a tough, uh, unanimous decision, but making himself memorable nonetheless by uh, taunting one of the most seasoned uh, people on the UFC roster. They will meet in the cage on Saturday. Uh, Algio currently cruising as a slight underdog, around plus 140, Carlisle available around minus 170, minus 175. How do you feel about this one, Keith? So as I talked in the intro, I think this is my favorite fight on the on the card. I think both guys are pretty good. Spike Carlisle, he's just a physically imposing freak. He's insanely aggressive. I love how Daniel Cormier described him in his last fight because he was commentating. He said he just straight bull rushes his opponents. He's very explosive. He hits very hard. He loves to step in elbows uh, from in close distance. He has a judo 
background, so he's got some pretty solid trips and throws. Good wrestling entries, which we show saw against uh, Quarantel. Tags, good ground and pound, though he will lose position looking for a submission. Happened a lot in the Quintillo fight. And he'll also gas out because, you know, he's sprinting the entire 15 minutes. Though he gassed out, he still had moments where he exploded. Like he, Quintillo would get a position and then Kyle would explode. Kind of very similar to what we see in Derek Lewis. Move over to Algio. He looked great against Ricardo Lomas in his UFC debut, which is obviously a very tough matchup in UFC debut going against a former title challenger. I also thought he sh- shouldn't have got lost. I don't think he should have won, but I thought he should have got a draw. I thought he won the first two rounds and lost the last round 10-8 when he gassed out. Uh, he's tall. He's long and lengthy. He has pro Muay Thai experience, high output, pressure striker, switches stances, kind of gets you guessing that way. He's Chris striking, quick hands, ends com- combinations with kicks and punches, uh, especially to the body, uh, step in knees to the body, has a nice high kick, loves flying s- strikes. He has that, um, s- he has a style similar sim- to, to means we're talking about. He uses his length to close the distance, not keep the distance, which is fine because he's good in the clinch. He keeps his hands low, relying solely on head movement, which is so funny because I always talk about guys and say they lack head movement. And then I have a guy like Algio that is all head movement. And I'm like, ah, you shouldn't lack solely on head movement. <laughs> um, I mean, no matter what, I'm just not going to give people credit when it comes to head movement. Uh, he will get hit, you know, punches that might catch an elbow, catch a forearm, kind of catch his chin. Uh, as I mentioned, he's solid in the clinch due to his height. He's a good wrestler, good takedowns. When he's defending takedowns, he likes to stuff the head down and kind of throw those Travis Brown downward elbows. Or he'll look for like a Kimura, which I would rather see the elbows because when he looks for the Kimura, he's been taken down by guys worse than him. He also does the head and arm throw, which gives up his back, which I absolutely hate. Though he's good in scrambles, he'll keep moving. He has a Tim Elliott style, a Brandon Roy Val style, where he'll keep his hips moving. He's a Bra- Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He he uses his length good on the ground. He looks for triangles, looks for omoplatas, does well to scramble back up. He did gas out again Ricardo Lamas, but it was his UFC debut in his Ricardo Lamas. So as far as prediction, as you saw, I talked a lot more about Algio than than Spike Kyle, more based on my contender series previews and, and seeing him on the contender series. This is my pick. I'm going to put it out now, right now. This is my pick for fight of the night. So I'll lock that in as my fight of the night pick. I like both guys' skills. I like both guys' futures. That said, I love Algio striking. If he can create a little distance, which is a big if against someone like Spike Kyle, he's going to come at him like a bull. But if he can have moments where they do. You know, he forces them to exchange on the feet. I think he'll do well. I think he's going to land the bigger shots and the better shots. Uh, there will be scrambles, and I think the scrambles are going to be really exciting between these two. I trust Aljo's gas tank a little bit more, even though they both kind of gassed out in the last fight. I'm going to take Aljo by split decision, and this is my upset special. So I'm putting both on this. I'm putting fight of the night and my upset pick of the night. I'm taking Aljo as a plus, plus 155, 160 underdog. So yep. that's my pick. Oh man, I I am with you that this one is the front runner for fight of the night, and I want to pick Aljo uh, so badly. You know, even, you already talked about uh, Aljo versus Lamas. You know, and there were a lot of positive takeaways there. Uh, one of them being that Lamas really couldn't get Aljo down until the last round when Aljo was really tired. Uh, you know, Ricardo Lamas has declined somewhat from his top five contender status that he seemed to carry forever in that division. Uh, but one of the last things to leave him is it's still tough to stop his takedown. Like, unless, you know, you're just a super powerful athletic guy, like, you know, you're a Mursad Bektich. So it, it was impressive that Aljo was, was able to, to stay off the, uh, stay off the canvas for the most part and uh, did punish him for trying for the first two rounds. However, like looking at Carlisle's fight versus Quarantillo, I thought Carlisle won that fight, you know, and the dynamic. Yeah. Like 
everyone has the dynamic down right. Uh, Carlisle came out like a house on fire, bat out of hell, like insert your own uh, metaphor there. But, you know, slowly gassed out and Quarantillo pulled ahead, just greater experience, greater poise, uh, you know, probably, you know, a more solid fundamental fighter in, in most phases. But I thought Carlisle did enough to win the second round as well. I can really see Aljo working a lot of the same game plan, a lot of the same dynamic on Carlisle that uh, Quarantillo did. Uh, you know, Aljo is, is another seasoned guy. He's, you know, got lots of career experience, got a, you know, some UFC experience at this point. There aren't going to be any jitters. I, I just, I want to say that, that Aljo will survive the onslaught in the first round and then hang on to win the second and third. But I thought Carlisle should have won the second and third, or should have won the first and second against Quarantillo. I, I think this fight looks a bit like that one. And uh, give me Spike Carlisle by decision in an absolute barn burner. UFC on ESPN 18 powers on with the first fight on the card that's above 145 pounds, assuming no egregious uh, weight violations on weigh-ins day, as Miguel Baeza takes on Takashi Sato in one of the more promising, one of the more evenly matched uh, fights on the card. Baeza, the 28-year-old Floridian, is an undefeated 9-0 in his professional career. He is 2-0 since joining the UFC from Dana White's Contender Series. He knocked out Hector Aldana last October, then took on Matt Brown in May at UFC on ESPN 8, uh, survived and got the better of a wild first round to knock out Brown early in the second. He'll be taking on Sato. The 30-year-old Japanese fighter is 16-3, and 2-1 and one in the UFC, uh, blew away Jason Witt back in June in 48 seconds to get back on the winning track after having lost to Bilal Muhammad in a fantastic fight last September. Uh, currently, Baeza is sitting as a slight favorite around minus 160. Sato available around plus 140. Keith, how do you feel about this one? Uh, this is another good card. I'm glad that it's on the main card. I think the placement of most of the fights on the main card are pretty good, except for one we'll get to soon. Uh, Baeza is a guy coming off the contender series. Uh, not coming off, but he came from the contender series. Well-rounded, uses a lot of movement. Uh, has crisp punches, stinging jab, follows it up with a basic one-two. Similar to what I talked about, Alex Perez, he's good at the basics, and I like that. Right hand is accurate. Decent power as he knocked out Matt Brown. Kicks to the legs, kicks to the body. The knockout of Matt Brown was really set up with the calf kicks that he did because you you know take out a man's legs, then you can kind of start head hunting. Defensively, he has a lot more flaws than just offensively. Like I really like him as an offensive fighter. Defensively, he kind of just pillars and doesn't head his doesn't move his head as much. Keeps his head really high and backs up to the cage, which is why Matt Brown cracked him. Like he was doing well, and then he got like forced to fight off his back foot. Had his head high, and Matt Brown caught him. He is a good wrestler, both with clinch takedowns and uh, drop step entry takedowns. Solid ground and pound. Move over to Sato. Sato's 30 years old, so he's kind of like in the prime. He's been training with Sanford MMA, which you get to like, you know, joining a, a, a good gym. Southport, very aggressive on the feet. Nice straight left hand down the pipe, which we saw in his last fight. Hits hard, like deceivingly hard. Hard leg kicks. He's a good wrestler, good ground and pound. It, this is a really tough fight, as I like both guys. But I'm going with the upset again, and I'm... I really didn't like that Matt Brown caught, at this point in his career, caught the chin of Baeza in that fight. I think if Sato catches the chin, I think Sato could put him out. So, And I also think Sato could just win a wrestling match. So I keep thinking about that straight left that he landed on Jason Witt. I think he could do the same thing to Baeza. So I'm going to take Sato. I'm going to say he knocks him out in an upset. It's not my upset special, but yeah, it's it's another upset pick for me. All right, I really should have gone first on that one because you said most of what I was going to say better than I could. So now it's just going to sound like I'm like cribbing from your notes or something. But uh, Baeza is slightly favored, and that's indicative of what you get some shine 
off of putting away a legend, even if it's a legend on his last legs. But I honestly found as much concerning about that fight as encouraging. Uh, Brown had come in to that fight off of back-to-back knockouts, but they were over uh, Ben Saunders and Diego Sanchez, both of whom respectfully are wiped at this point. That he was able to catch Baeza as much as he did in the first round was not encouraging. And especially because this is kind of a classic matchup of an aggressor who wants to come forward and push the action versus someone who prefers to counter-strike. And those fights can turn out any number of ways. Either guy can win, just depending on who's better at what he does. But uh, Sato, you know, throws too straight, too hard, and I I just think Baeza is going to end up walking in, into something. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't call Sato a sniper. You know, he's not Anderson Silva or even Chuck Liddell as you come running at him, but uh, he, you know, he knows how to give ground, give ground, then, you know, plant and, and throw a counter that people seem to run onto. I have uh, Sato in this one, and I'm just going to go for the gold. Give me Sato by first round knockout. That your upset special? It is not my upset special. Oh, I like that. You got another one coming. I like that. Hey. And you'll learn about it the same time all the rest of the I have an gold. idea which one it is. It is a time-honored UFC tradition, especially for free cable cards, that every main card must have one heavyweight matchup that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense in terms of card placement, even if the card already has a better heavy, heavyweight matchup on it. With that in mind, we move on to Josh Parisian versus Parker Porter. Parisian, the 31-year-old two-time veteran of Dana White's contender series is 13 and 3 overall. He will be making his UFC debut. Finally, the UFC or the UFC, I, the universe has stopped conspiring to keep him out of the UFC. He'll be taking on Porter. Porter is 35 years old, 9 and 6 overall. He is 0 and 1 in the UFC. He debuted in August against Chris Dawkins and lost at the end of a fairly entertaining uh, first round, and he is trying to get things back on track here. Uh, I'll go first. I was impressed with Parisian in his first Dana White's Contender Series uh, appearance. He flattened a man with a spinning back fist, and the most interesting thing about the fight was that his pants fell down every time he tried to throw that thing, every time he tried to throw that strike. Like, I, the happy ending for Parisian is that he finally made it to the octagon where he's not using, you know, the one size fits most, uh, you know, hand me down fight kits. And he's going to have some shorts that will stay on him when he tries uh, some of his techniques. Uh, even though he didn't get the contract off of his first appearance, he did exactly what you should do. He went right back to the regionals and got busy. He went five and one in like two years between his two uh, appearances on Dana White's contender series off of the second one uh, this August, where he knocked out Chad Johnson in the first round, he he's getting the call. I have thought the Parisian is better than the bottom 25 or 30% of the UFC's heavyweight roster since the last time he was on the Contender Series. I don't know if he's a future top 10 contender. That's That's hard to say about a heavyweight prospect unless they're just, you know, off the charts. They look like Cain Velasquez after four fights. But I think Parisian has staying power. Parisian is a minus 230 favorite in this one. I am perfectly comfortable with that, even at heavyweight. Uh, I'll leave you to make the, the more detailed scouting report on Porter, just because you've, you've seen him more than I have. But his performance against uh, Dacus in his debut basically played out, you know, as your prediction, uh, you know, would indicate. I like Parisian in this one. I like Parisian... Uh, you know, Porter's a tough guy, and that was a wild fight. This one might not be as wild since he knows that, you know, his, his job is in no way secure. But give me Parisian by second round knockout in this one. Yeah. So the thing that jumps out of Parisian, besides all, like, it seems like we've been waiting for this guy to be in the UFC forever. Uh, he also trains in that Scorpion fighting system team mm-hmm. w- out in Michigan, which is really starting to blossom into a pretty solid, like, up-and-coming team. Uh, that's where Alicia Zapatelli comes out of. That's where Amanda Bobby Cooper and 
her husband, I can't remember his name, Brundage. Brundage, Brundage yeah. Yeah, uh, Cody Brundage come out of that team. Somebody else recently, I can't remember who, besides Parisian, who came out of that team. Um, so, yeah, just I just I just want to point that out. Like, I feel like it's a team I've been talking about a lot more. Uh, he's a huge heavyweight Parisian. He has to cut to make the 265-pound weight class. He's just a burly kind of guy. Uh, he's kind of slow, unathletic, kind of like a Tim Sylvia type, like just kind of burly. Uh, he has a straight jab that he uses a lot, lots of kicks. As you mentioned, he has that beautiful spinning knockout o- over Greg Rebello. He has some big defensive flaws. He ducks his head right to the same side over and over again, or he pulls his head straight back, which which could be an issue. Not a wrestler, but if he ends up on top, he's got some pretty solid top control that just happens from being very big. He is a weak defensive wrestler. Going back to the when he was on the Tough Show, Michelle Batista, who I believe was in the Olympics, was taking him down at will. Though he was hard to hold down, he had his incredible heart. He just kept working back to his feet, get taken down and work right back to his feet. He just keeps coming. He reminds me of like a heavyweight Vince Michelle. And, and I mean that as a compliment, Vince Michelle beats guys simply just by keep coming. Like guys who are technically better than him and probably just a better MMA fighter. Vince Michelle will find a way to win just because he just like, like Jamila, he just kept coming after him. And eventually broke him. Moving to Par- uh, Parker Porter, this is the guy that uh, I like Parker Porter as a person. I see him at the regional shows a lot. I've seen him fight a lot. He's a nice guy. He he trains out of the underdog team, which is where Matt Bissett and Jesse Mealy and, and a lot of the local New Englanders come from. Just like, like a good, solid team of like good people. That says, if I'm having an honest assessment of this guy... When I seen him on the regional scene, I never saw a UFC caliber fighter, and I still don't. Now the guy is very big. The I know you say he's like three hundred pounds when he's not in camp. Like he's very big. He's slow. He's unathletic. He's pretty one dimensional. Uh, he's a striker who who's pretty aggressive. He's got to come at you. He came after Chris Dacus. He loves his jab overhand right combination. He'll just throw it over and over again. He does have power as a nearly 300-pound guy should. The best part of the game is probably his leg kicks, is he has massive legs himself. He also, similar to his opponent, dips to the same right side over and over again, which is going to leave him open to left-side attacks. And he walks right in shots. Like, Doc is blasting, but he also walked into that punch. As I said, I don't think Porter's UFC level. I do think Parisian is. You know, will he be a top fifteen guy? No, but probably just below that. You know, if he he snuck into a rankings one, okay. I think Parisian lands the big shot. I'll say midway through the first, so I'll take Parisian my first round knockout. With that, we come to the co-main event of UFC Vegas fifteen as former light heavyweight title challenger Anthony Smith takes on Devin Clark. Smith, 32 years old, is 33 and 16 in his incredibly lengthy and well-traveled career. He is 8 and 6 in the UFC. Uh, He is coming off back-to-back losses to Alexander Rakic and Glover Teixeira. Uh, Before that was a win over Alexander Gustafsson that sent the Swede into temporary retirement. And before that, of course, was his unsuccessful title shot at John Jones. Clark, also 32 years old, 12 and four overall, six and four in the UFC. He is coming off back-to-back wins, albeit over not quite the same level of competition that Smith has been taking on uh, in Alonzo Menafield, whom he defeated in June, and Dequan Townsend, uh, whom he beat in February. Currently, uh, Smith is a bit of a favorite, sitting around minus 140 or minus 150. Clark available right around plus 125. Keith, who takes it in our light heavyweight co-main event? Well, if you asked me a year ago, I would have laughed at these odds. Like A year ago, Anthony Smith would have been a massive favorite. Now he's just a slight favorite, which is... Um, I think rightfully so. Like I don't. I was. I was going to say surprising, but it shouldn't be. This is probably where the line sh- should be. Now Smith, 
He's only 32 years old, which is crazy to think when he already has 49 professional fights. He has taken, and he has taken so much damage on top of that. I mean, he was decimated by Glover Teixeira in their fight. In his last fight against Alexander Rakic, it was only a three-round fight, but if that was five-round, he would have got on his way to maybe a Glover Teixeira-type whooping. Anthony Smith's insane toughness is actually a bad thing for him. Like, if he was wasn't as tough and quit, like, he wouldn't have taken as much damage, and he, he'd probably be a better light heavyweight right now than he is because he t- took – I mean, Mark Montoya should have threw the towel in when Anthony Smith was just had this blank – stare in the glove of the sheriff i think it was like in the fourth round instead he goes out there and gets beat up for like another 10 minutes uh Anthony Smith, he's never been a great athlete which is fine he's never been his game he just he makes up for being technical he's well-rounded good outfighter his hands are still pretty fast he has a salad jab uh never big you know power puncher he makes up for that with his high output he throws combinations though he can punch himself out. That's what he did against the Teixeira fight. He slowed down when he kind of came out to share with an ins- insane pace, and Teixeira was still standing there heading in, you know, midway through the second round. I like the variety of strikes. He can tack with both the hands and the feet. He likes the teep kicks, he, uh, a lot of leg kicks, though he needs to learn how to check leg kicks because Alexander Rakic just tore up his leg to the point where he fell down with leg kicks. Uh, Smith is good and tight. Where he likes to throw elbows. He does make the mistake of backing up to the cage, kind of like a little Tyra Woodley in him. Glover Teixeira battered him there. John Jones, going back to that fight, is you know, John Jones has success against everyone, but John Jones battered him up with, with Smith's back against the cage. Um, he's not a wrestler, but he can sneak in a takedown if, if you're not aware of it. And he's a decent grappler. He has a submission threat. Though, if he's taken down, he struggles to get back up if you're on bottom, which is a huge issue against a guy like Devin Clark. Devin Clark has shown some improvements recently. However, he's still pretty raw and one-dimensional. He is fairly flat-footed on the feet, though he is very physically strong. You just look at him. He's got an incredible physique. He's got huge legs, big shoulders. He hits pretty hard. Though he does stay very tense, he like his arms are always like flexing in his stand up, which will burn energy. He will throw wildly. He keeps his chin high in the air. He's been blasted and hurt in so many. He is solid in the plum clinch. That's a really good safe area for him. He has got strong knees up the middle in the clinch. That's what he did very well against Menafield in. And he, he's willing, he likes that because he's willing to just to grind against the cage and make it an ugly, kind of boring affair. Very solid wrestler, good good entries, good reactionary double. He'll get you to like come towards him and he'll drop underneath for a shot. Good at turning the corner, finishing, strong top control. So, as I talked about in the intro, this is a close fight on paper, which is really surprising at this point of their two careers. I'm still going to take Smith simply because I feel like this is a big step down in competition for him. And I'm assuming that's, and this is a big assumption. I'm assuming Smith hasn't fallen off that far yet. So I'm not very confident in Smith anymore. I don't, I just don't think Clark has taken that step up. Like I feel like they're, they might be crossing at the mountain, but just not yet. So I wouldn't be surprised if Smith just out wrestles. Uh, excuse me, if, if if Clark just out wrestles Smith for 15 minutes, but if he can't, I still think Smith's output on the feet. I don't expect him to throw a lot of kicks in this fight if he's smart, because you don't want to give Clark the chance to catch one. But I still think he can just jab him up and move. So I'm going to take Smith. I'm going to say, I mean, Clark's pretty tough, so I'll take Smith by decision. Excellent. In looking at Anthony Smith's recent run, for me at least, I I think uh, I was probably, along with a a lot of other people, tempted to push his stock up too high on his way up since moving up to light heavyweight. And now I think I am tempted to push him back down into the general population at 205, maybe faster than he deserves as well. You know, he moved up to to 205, uh, 
goodness, almost three years ago now, after losing to Tiago Santos, and he just immediately rattled off uh, two spectacular wins over Evans and Shogun, then won a tough fight against Vulcan Uzdemir that was his first real top 10 challenge to get the title shot against Jones. But in in, in hindsight, in Evans and Hua, who, you know, Evans was almost out the door and Hua definitely has been a depleted version of himself. Those were the guys that the Anthony Smith thing works on because whether it 170, 185, or 205, it seems like he always has the same strengths and the same liabilities no matter what weight, weight class he's in. Even for, whether it's at 170 or at 205, he's never the physically stronger guy, but he's always got kind of surprising, uh, you know, hand speed, decent power, not like knock you flat power, but enough that if he connects with a combination, you know, the combined impact, if, you know, if, if he tags you with a, a, a one, two, then comes, you know, crashing in, hits you with a knee and then nails you with an elbow against the cage, you are going to go down from the combined damage. Really in his last two losses, he's, he's lost to people who can, who are not just bigger and more physical, but are the type of fighters that make that work on, on him, that, that make you wear their weight. Against Glover Teixeira, it, it was just all we talked about afterwards was you know how bad the non stoppage was, how it should have been stopped sooner, how he was gutty. Was it the ref's fault? Was it his corner's fault? The thing I came away with was that was the worst game plan ever on his part. He was trying to do something that nobody has done to Glover Teixeira other than Anthony Johnson in like fifteen years of fighting the best, uh, you know, some of the best light heavyweights in the world. Like, you don't just go run up on Glover Teixeira and blitz him in the first round, again, unless you're Rumble Johnson, arguably the hardest hitter in, in the history of the sport at any weight. Then against Rockets, just, hey, it turns out that Alexander Rockets is really, really good. And again, just a dreadful style matchup for Smith. Clark can be that guy. He is a bigger, physically stronger guy. He is a better offensive wrestler than Smith is a defensive wrestler. But that would be me trusting him to do the smart thing. I don't know if he will. I, I wonder if he will be a little overconfident coming in against Smith. And give me give me Smith. I, I, I don't trust Smith's gas tank anymore. But this is only a three-round fight, and I don't even think it goes three rounds. Give me Anthony Smith to, to pop Devin Clark with something uh, surprising and nasty and finish him in the second round, either with strikes or by pouncing on him and choking him out. Smith by finish, second round. That brings us to the main event and the aforementioned meeting of Irresistible Force versus Irresistible Force as Curtis Blades takes on Derek Lewis in an ultra-high stakes heavyweight matchup. I don't believe it's been expressly said that the winner of this fight is on track for a title shot, but they've got to be really, really close. Blades, the 29-year-old, is 14-2. and two. He is 9-2 and two in the UFC. Those only two losses coming to Francis Ngannou. He has won four straight since his last meeting with Ngannou, uh, wiping out Justin Willis in one of the more uh, humiliating examples of offensive wrestling advantage in recent heavyweight history. Then put away Shamil Abdurakhimov. In September of last year, knocked out Junior Dos Santos in January, and then in June, took on Alexander Volkov and once again uh, applied his significant wrestling advantage to win a five-round decision over the Russian. Lewis, 35 years old, 24 and 7, 15 and 5 in the UFC. He has won his last three, having defeated Blagoy Ivanov last November. Ilir Latifi in February of this year, and most recently flirted with disaster on the ground against Alexi Olenek for much of a round before knocking him out early in the second at UFC Fight Night Lewis versus Olenek in August. Blades is the significant favorite here, sitting around minus 350, whereas Lewis is pushing right up against the plus 300 mark as the underdog. I'll go ahead and go first on this one. These odds 
are exactly as they should be. On paper, Blades is one of the most dreadful style matchups in the division for Derek Lewis. I said off the top of the show that he is the UFC's all-time leader in takedowns. He's the UFC's all-time leader in takedowns by almost double the number of the number two guy. And you think of some of the people who have been in that division. Your Steve Miocic, Cain Velasquez, Daniel Cormier. Some of those guys. Randy Couture. Curtis Blades has almost double the number of takedowns as the next guy. And he's not even 30 years old yet. And beyond just the numbers on paper, there is the eyeball test. He looks like possibly the greatest takedown artist this division has ever seen. He has a beautiful offensive wrestling game. I've said before that the strange thing about Curtis Blades is if you look at him just standing against a wall without anyone near him, he looks like he could be like a, a middleweight or something. He just he has the the body of an elite athlete just blown up to the size of a 260 pound man. He's one of the few people in the heavyweight division that like shoots a for real power double. Like Brock Lesnar was the last guy I could think of that, you know, really liked to lean on that as as a primary way to get takedowns. Uh, there's every reason to think that he'll just bulldoze Derek Lewis like a road grader. And the thing about Blades is he's not a lay and pray guy. He is busy once he gets on top. He's not, I, I wouldn't say he's quite Cain Velasquez, where it was just breathtaking, like how violently he would just beat seven colors of shit out of people once he got on top of them. But certainly he's not a man who gets stood up for inactivity. And he, he never stops being hungry to do damage when, when he gets on top of people. Uh, you know, he put away Alistair Overeem with, you know, just minutes left in a fight he was winning anyway, just because he wanted to elbow a hole in his head. So there's, there's every reason that this guy should be a three and a half to one favorite over Derek Lewis. There are a few things that, get, that give me pause. I, I think the popular perception of Derek Lewis it's accurate in general, but there are some holes in it. You know, Lewis has been kind of undertrained and in questionable shape for his fights for so long that it's almost a running joke that leading up to a fight, he'll be like, well, now my back feels better. This is the time I've really been training like I've never trained before. And then he goes out and he's exactly the same Derek Lewis that he's been for eight years now. I'm not even saying that as a criticism. It's endearing. I, I, I love that Derek Lewis is just the most reliable product. But within that... I mean, he, he just looks like a, a huge guy who is somewhat trained. He is a nimble and agile guy. He throws head kicks like very few heavyweights to have at the top level. Uh, even though he is routinely breathing with his mouth open by the end of the first round, even before he was the UFC's uh, all-time leader in knockouts, long before that, he was the UFC's all-time leader in knockouts in the third round or later. He's a guy that, you know, it's kind of like, uh, well, Yoel Romero is another one that I, I think of that even when he looks tired, he never stops throwing effective offense. I mean, you can start rattling off the people that he just dusted after losing two rounds and looking like the more tired man. And it goes all the way back to Gabriel Gonzaga in one of his first couple of UFC fights. So there are avenues to victory for him. Uh, he's not, he's not a complete dope on the ground. Daniel Cormier made him look like one, but that's, that's Daniel Cormier. Uh, Derek Lewis is kind of like Mark Hunt and Sheck Congo in that they have surprising survivability and escapability on the ground for a guy that there's nothing he does that a jiu-jitsu coach would even have a name for. You know, Congo would just sort of bench press people off of him. Mark Hunt would just kind of shrug and stand up when he felt like he had enough. Derek Lewis has both of those moves down. You know, if quote-unquote... Jiu-jitsu doesn't work. I would just stand up or a person. It would be Derek Lewis. Uh, so <laughs> I think while, while Blades is and should be favored to win, I think he's going to have rougher sledding than people expect. For as long as this thing is on the feet, he is in the danger zone. Curtis Blades has shown that he can be put down with one hard punch behind the ear. And other than the man who did it, Francis Ngannou, Derek Lewis is like the other guy in the division that can do that. So if Blades finds, you know, that the takedowns aren't coming quite as easily as he expected in the first round, or if he makes the questionable decision to hang out on the feet longer than he should, which he has against a couple of opponents, uh, like staying, like playing in, in the danger zone 
did you know did not cost him against a, a Volkov or a Dos Santos in the way it will against Lewis. So we have a a hearty, healthy underdog here who nonetheless has demonstrable routes to victory that he's shown that he can accomplish before. So put me down. This is my upset pick of the night. Give me Derek Lewis over Curtis Blades by first round knockout. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. So two weeks in a row, we had a main event where one of the fighters was a big favorite and one of us called the upset. Now, my pick last week was terrible. Hopefully yours is is much better. So... Well, I, before this, before we do that, let's even just say you made the upset pick and Alex Perez gave us a hell of a fight for two minutes, you know, before that didn't pan out. At the very least, let Lewis please just give me that. <laughs> so the only thing probably crazier than, uh, you know, picking a big upset in the main event is Curtis Blades is 29. You said he's 29. It's just like crazy to me because he's, he's been in the UFC a while. He's been a top contender and it's heavyweight. Like heavyweights are all so much older and he's 29. It's, it's insane. Uh, he, he's, as you mentioned, he's a big heavyweight. As you mentioned, Curtis Blades is athletic. He's pretty light on the feet. Though his striking is developing uh, and he still lacks confidence in it, I do think it's it's improving. He's got really long arms, which helps his striking. He has good shoulder feints. He's got a developing straight right that's sudden landing for him. Hard leg kicks. He's got, you know, he's a big heavyweight, so he's got knockout power. He still, for the most part, strikes to set up his takedowns. He's, as you mentioned, he's the best wrestler in the heavyweight division. And right now, you know, other than Daniel Cormier, if he's still in the division, Right now, it's not even close. His entries are fantastic. He shoots doubles. Kane Velasquez would shoot double every once in a while. Go all the way back to Kevin Randleman. You know, like, mm-hmm. the, the, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about shooting. I mean, Rico Rodriguez occasionally, Randy Couture, but not to the consistency uh, that you mentioned by the stats of Curtis Blades on his just his drop step entry. He drives right through his opponent's hips. He's relentless with it. And what stands out to me most is he knows who he is. He doesn't he doesn't stand up and bang with his opponent because that's what the fans want. He knows he has an advantage in wrestling. He'll go right to it. He did slow down against Alexander Volkov in his last fight, and this is a, another main event, another five round fight. And as you mentioned about Dan, uh, Derek Lewis, which I'll start with his analysis. I 100% agree that the old, like, Derek Lewis doesn't have a cardio or his cardio is bad. I think it's crazy. Like, yes, his body makes him look like he's tired, but he continues in the fight and then wins late. I mean, I think about his, like, his fight against recently against Aliyah Latifi. That was probably 1 1 hitting in the third. Latifi was winning the third round for the most part. And then the last. Two minutes, Derek Lewis dug deep and won the fight. Uh, Derek Lewis is also a big heavyweight. He's got absolute crushing power, as you says. If he hits you, there's a very good chance he's knocking you out. You mentioned his high kick. He's sneaky high kick. He's very athletic. He, you, you did. I don't think you mentioned his flying knee. Like he'll, he'll just <laughs> throw a flying knee, which is crazy when you see a guy who you know come fight night is probably two eighty five, and most of that weight is upstairs. Yeah, he's in like smaller <laughs> legs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he throws looping punches, which I don't like a lot. A lot of his like he's kind of throwing from his hips. He though his right hand is kind of straight, but he does like a looping left. He another thing that Derek Lewis doesn't get enough credit for is how good his chin is. Like we don't see him get hurt like on the feet by anybody. That said, his biggest weakness is his wrestling. He's a terrible I mean, he doesn't really use offense wrestling, but he's a terrible defense wrestler. Though, if you get him down, which you most likely will, and I'm safe to say, other than Derek Lewis catching him early, Curtis Blades is going to get him down. He explodes, similar to what we talked about Spike Carlisle. He'll he'll sit there and wait and wait and wait, and then also just explode. And and you say he bench press or just you know cut his arm like on the underhook and just kind of 
bridge up and, and get up. If Curtis Blades is on top of him and he bridges and somehow lands on top, which has happened, Derek Lewis has maybe, like you talked about Curtis Blades' ground and pound. Derek Lewis might have the scariest ground and pound ever. Like, I couldn't, that, a nightmare would be Derek Lewis on top of you throwing down hammer fists. That said, moving on to prediction, we're disagreeing on this one, and we're disagreeing from the two most extremes. I think Blades mauls him. I think this fight is going to look a lot like the Daniel Cormier fight. As we mentioned, Latifi, Latifi's half Curtis Blade size, and he took Lewis down several times. At one point, he just like pushed him over. I think Lewis has the Hail Mary punch. I think he has a flying knee punch. He has a chance of Curtis Blades gassing out. and But I still I think they're all very, very small. Give me Curtis Blades to take him down over and over again. I think he gets a third round TKO from Grand Pound. And you calling your and I'm not doing this to like insult you. So please don't take it this way. You pick Derek Lewis as you upset. I'm going the complete opposite. I was locking in Curtis Blades as my lock of the night. I think it's money in the bank that Curtis Blades wins. It's there my most have, confident pick. There you <laughs> go. We we are polar opposites. Uh Sometimes we differ on these picks. Sometimes uh, we're we're in lockstep. This is the first time that we have disagreed so vehemently and so furiously. All I know is that by Saturday night, I will have plowed through all of the Thanksgiving leftovers so that I can go get myself a fresh, large box of Popeye's chicken to sit and watch Derek Lewis pull off uh, a finalist for upset of the year. And I will be on the Sherdog sure Radio Network immediately afterwards to let Keith absolutely have it. That will do it for the SureDog Radio preview of UFC on ESPN 18 or UFC Vegas 15, Blades vs. Lewis. For a quick rundown of all the picks, in the opener, Nathan Maness vs. Luke Sanders. Ben has Sanders by decision. Keith has Sanders by second round TKO. Flyweights, Sue Mudarji and Malcolm Gordon. Keith and Ben both have Mudarji by decision. In the featherweight matchup between Kai Kamaka III and Jonathan Pierce, Ben has Kamaka by decision. Keith has Kamaka by first round knockout or TKO. In the women's flyweight matchup between Gina Mazzani and Rachel Ostovich, Keith has Ostovich by decision, while Ben has Mazzani by third round uh, finish, submission or knockout. Bantamweights, Martin Day and Anderson Dos Santos. Both Keith and I have day by decision. In the women's bantamweight matchup between Ashley Evans-Smith and Norma Dumont-Viana, both of us have Dumont-Viana by decision. In the featherweight main card opener between Spike Carlisle and Bill Algio, we have dissension. Ben has Carlisle by decision. Keith has Algio by decision. It is both of our pick for fight of the night. Miguel Baeza versus Takashi Sato at welterweight. Keith has Sato by second round knockout. Ben has Sato by first round knockout. In the heavyweight scrap between Josh Parisian and Parker Porter, Ben has Parisian by second round knockout. Keith has Parisian by first round knockout. At light heavyweight, Anthony Smith takes on Devin Clark in the co-main event. Keith has Smith by decision. Ben has Smith by second round KO or TKO. And in the headliner, Curtis Blades versus Derek Lewis. Keith has Blades by third round TKO. Ben has his upset special, Derek the Black Beast Lewis by first round knockout. That's it. Those are the picks. Enjoy your Thanksgiving if you're in the United States and definitely enjoy the vibes.